let's see here. Uh, oh, I want to go to the uh, chapter real quick. I want to pull up a couple of pictures from the uh, chapter um, just to get us kind of oriented to things. And I'm going to switch to showing you stuff on the model. Um, oh, whoops, too far. Here's this one. Um, so in class, we talked about the location of the heart in the mediastinum and the, uh, talked about the pericardium. Um, and we'll come back to that in a second. And also in class, uh, I talked about the layers of the wall of the heart and structure of the pericardium, the fibrous pericardium. That's all right here in the um, chapter. Uh, here they address the... Um, idea of the chambers to some degree in terms of how blood circulates through the system. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, I just want to pull that picture up. Uh, the surface anatomy of the heart, um, you can look at uh, here if you want to. I'm going to pay more attention to what we see inside the heart, which is represented in this picture here. Um, now, um, in talking about the structures of the heart, there's basically 12 things that I want to talk about. Um, uh, there are four chambers and uh, four major vessels that are connected to the heart. and four valves. Um, so that, of course, equals 12 things. Uh, and I want to talk about these. Um, switching back and forth from the camera to the screen is going to be a little bit much. So I'm going to talk about all this and write everything on the screen here. Um, and then uh, I'll switch to the model and point things out for you. Um, the chambers, uh, there are four of them, obviously. Two of them are superior, two of them are inferior, uh, and of those, two are on the right, two are on the left. The superior chambers are called atria, that's plural, singular is atrium, and the inferior ones are called ventricles. So we have the right atrium and the right oops, ventricle, and then the left atrium and, oops, and the left ventricle. Now, the order I'm writing them in here is actually on purpose to correspond to the direction of blood flow. So blood flows through the right atrium, then to the right ventricle, and then leaves the heart to go to the lungs and comes back to the left atrium and then into the left ventricle and then gets pumped out to the body. I'll come back to this uh, depiction in a little while. But uh, that's the reason why I wrote them in that order. Um, I also want to uh, list the major vessels that are connected to the heart uh, in a similar order. So blood that's coming back from the body, the deoxygenated used blood, comes through the vena cava, or vena cava, however you want to pronounce that. Bless you. Um, there is an inferior and a superior component to that vessel. Um, the inferior vena cava is carrying blood from the lower body, just everything inferior to the heart, and the superior vena cava is carrying blood from the, uh, the superior part of the body, everything superior to the heart. Basically that means the uh, inferior vena cava is carrying things from the legs and the abdominal cavity, and the superior is carrying things from the head, neck, shoulders, and arms. Uh, but all that comes back to the heart, which then goes into the right atrium. The right atrium then pumps the blood down to the right ventricle, and then the right ventricle pumps that blood out into what's called the pulmonary trunk. And this is the pulmonary trunk of the pulmonary arteries. Um, so it's a single vessel that comes out of the right ventricle, and then it branches right and left into the right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery, each one going to the lungs, which hopefully should be obvious because of the word pulmonary. Um, 
<clears throat> and then in the lungs, the blood picks up new oxygen. And then coming back from the lungs, there are the pulmonary veins. While there's one pulmonary trunk leaving the, heart, the right side of the heart, there are actually four pulmonary veins. They never come down into a single vessel. Um, and those attach to the left atrium. And the left atrium then pumps that down into the left ventricle. And the left ventricle pumps that freshly oxygenated blood out to the body through the aorta. Um, so again, I've listed these four things. Um, in terms of the order that uh, blood moves through the system. Um, and let me go back to that picture here for a sec. Um, the vena cava, vena cava, whatever, there's the superior and inferior components that are bringing blood into the right atrium, which is right here, and so we see the arrows pointing towards right atrium and lines depicting the blood flowing in there. And then the blood goes from the right atrium into the right ventricle and the right ventricle pumps it up into the pulmonary trunk, which there's one pulmonary trunk. It then splits into the right and left pulmonary arteries, which then further split to distribute the blood throughout the lungs. Um, then coming back from the lungs, the blood travels through the pulmonary veins. There are two on the left here and two on the right. Uh, they all connect to the uh, left ventricle. And so we can see these four white lines coming in, suggesting the pathway uh, from those four uh, vessels there. The blood then goes from the left atrium to left ventricle, and the left ventricle pumps it up into the aorta, which uh, arcs over or arches over the um, heart and the, uh, it then descends down posterior to the heart which we see down here at the bottom this is the descending aorta um, it's just obscured by the heart but this is the continuation of this vessel up here carrying the blood down uh, to the lower body the blood going up to the upper body is going up through these three branches here um, and we'll talk about what comes off of the aorta next week when we're looking at the blood vessels. Yeah. Um, so those are those eight things, um, again, presented in order based on how blood's flowing through the whole system. Uh, and then we have four valves. Now, I'm not going to present this quite the same way. I'm not going to say this valve and that valve and that valve and that valve in the order that the blood flows through them. Instead, um, there's two types of valves. There are atrioventricular valves, which is abbreviated AV. Uh, the AV is an abbreviation for atrioventricular, um, not atrioventricular valve. That's why I put the AV before the word valve. Um, and I'm pointing that out because we actually use the abbreviation AV in a couple of other places, and it always stands for atrioventricular. The name, of course, suggests that they're found between the atria and the ventricles. And in fact, that's true. The point of a valve is to ensure that blood flows in only one direction. Um, so these AV valves um, make sure that the blood from the atria is going down into the ventricle. Um, <clears throat> on the right side, that is the tricuspid valve. And on the left side, it's the mitral valve, which is also known as the bicuspid valve. So bicuspid and tricuspid actually, you know, obviously sound kind of similar, different number of cusps. Uh, but actually, the bi bicuspid valve is more often referred to as the uh, mitral valve. Um, <clears throat> it might sound, therefore, as if the tricuspid valve is special because it has three cusps. Uh, but in fact, it's not. Um, all valves have three cusps except, except for the mitral valve or the bicuspid valve. <clears throat> it's just that only the um, uh, tricuspid valve is named for that fact. Um, and then the other type is called a semilunar valve. Uh, 
um, which would be abbreviated SL, although I don't actually tend to abbreviate it, but just for um, consistency's sake. And there are two of those, of course, um, giving us a total of four. These are between the ventricles and the arteries that they connect to. Um, and they're both named for the artery that, where we find them. Uh, so on the right side, we have the pulmonary valve. And on the left side, we have the aortic valve. Um, so again, those are the different players there. Uh, let me go back to this picture here, um, picture here, to point these out. Um, valves, again, ensure that blood flows in only one direction, so they're kind of like um, uh, funnels. Did I talk about that in class yesterday? Funnels? Lobster cages? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so they're depicted here kind of like that. Uh, this, of course, is a two-dimensional picture, so it's not showing us three cusps, at the, but this is, in fact, the tricuspid valve um, that makes sure that the blood from the atrium it goes into the ventricle. I should say the right atrium into the right ventricle. And then the blood goes through the pulmonary valve up into the pulmonary trunk. And then the blood coming back from the lungs into the left atrium goes through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. And then the left ventricle pumps that up through the um, aortic valve, which then continues on up to the aorta. Now, in a two-dimensional drawing like this, it's necessary for them to make the aortic valve look like it's really low down here. But in fact, it would be at the same level as the pulmonary valve. It would be completely obscured by it in this kind of anterior view. Uh, so the models are important so that we can see the um, three-dimensional relationships for this. So I'm going to try switching over to the camera now and um, here we go, and actually <clears throat> show you this stuff on the model. So this is going to be interesting. <clears throat> and I got you out of the picture there, George. <laughs> um, okay, so um, on these models, there's actually a number of different size models, but you can always take the walls off of them. So as I pull this off, uh, we're looking into the, of course, everything's turned around. Okay, so we're looking into the right ventricle. Uh, the image has been reversed on the screen because cameras do that uh, for some stupid reason. Um, I can actually stick my finger into the inferior vena cava, and we can see it coming out here. The superior one is solid plastic, so I can't do that, but it would come out right there. We can see that dark spot there. Um, looking down into the uh, right ventricle, we can see where the valve's placed right here. In this particular model, the valve is actually made out of paper um, to show the cusps. and. Um, Come on, there we go. Uh, we can see the tendi cord. Oh, okay. I keep forgetting. Everything's reversed on the screen. So this is the right ventricle here. Um, so we can see the tendi cordini, which are depicted by little pieces of string here. Um, and then the right ventricle is going to pump the blood up into the pulmon through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary trunk here. Okay. Um, and then that splits right and left to go to the lungs, and then coming back from the lungs, on the posterior side of the heart, we can see uh, two pulmonary veins on either side. Um, this is the right side here, right side here, and this is the left side. We can pull that cover off, and we can see into the um, right atrium, and we can look down through the mitral valve there into the left, did I say right atrium? Left atrium. We can look down into the left ventricle there. And again, the mitral valve is depicted with paper um, for the cusps and little pieces of uh, string representing the cordy tendon. Um, and then the left ventricle will pump up through the aortic valve, which will go to the aorta. Um, all right, this is going to be kind of tricky to do with the camera. Um, and let me put this wall back on. I want to give you the um, 
sort of view, a uh, interior view here. I really got to figure out how to get this camera to switch depictions. But um, <clears throat> so as we're looking at the interior view, the pulmonary trunk here is on top of the pulmonary, I mean, on top of the aorta. So the pulmonary valve, which is right about here, is directly on top of the aortic valve, which would be deep to it under there. And taking this off, we can kind of see that they're sitting, okay, one behind the other. Yeah, I really hate this camera now. Um, maybe I won't use this camera too often, but we can see that like there, okay. Um, so what I want you to do looking at the models, which again, I'll have you actually do when we're done with everything just for uh, um, covering stuff with the recording here. Um, pay attention to the three-dimensional uh, information structure uh, and follow through how the blood um, goes from the body to the right side of the heart, gets pumped to the lungs, and then back to the left side of the heart to get pumped back out to the body. Okay. Um, <clears throat> while I have this model here, I also want to point something out. Uh, as we look into the left atrium here from the posterior view, there's this big round spot here, which technically would be an oval, but it's not quite depicted that way. Um, we see that here, and if we look in the... <clears throat> oh, come on. Sort of there. If we look into the right atrium, we can see the same thing kind of right there. Okay. In the fetal heart, the two atria are actually connected. There's a hole between them called the foramen ovale, meaning oval hole. Um, <clears throat> fetal circulation is different than adult circulation because uh, the fetus is, of course, not breathing, not using their lungs, um, so uh, things don't work quite work the same way. Um, and that foramen ovale seals up to uh, separate the right and left atria at the atrial septum. Um, some people, when they're born, still have that hole there, which is referred to as an atrial septal defect, uh, or ASD. Um, and uh, um, it should close off. For some people, it closes off shortly after birth, and it's not really a big deal. But for other people, it doesn't close off, and there's... Um, <clears throat> mixing of oxygenated blood from the left atrium with deoxygenated blood on the right atrium, which cuts down on the amount of oxygen that's available to be distributed back out to the body. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that can usually be fixed surgically, which involves open heart surgery to go in and actually uh, seal it up. Yeah. Um, Accumulation of fluid in the lungs, is that only the right uh, atrium and ventricle work? And then when it pumps out, we cannot, the left side doesn't work. Is that how you know what I'm saying? So you just said accumulation of uh, fluid in the lungs, which is a very vague thing to say. But if you're talking about it in terms of the um, heart, if there's fluid accumulated in the lungs because of something going on with the heart, that's what we call congestive heart failure. And it's because the right side of the heart doesn't pump enough, um, isn't pumping, well, the heart in general isn't pumping very well. So uh, it's not pumping the fluid through the heart, through the lungs very well. And so more blood sort of accumulates in the lungs. Um, more often, actually, the problem isn't going to be in the lungs as much as in the liver. Um, the blood that's coming back to the right side, its last stop is basically the liver. All of the blood from the rest of your abdominal uh, organs goes through the liver before it goes into the inferior vena cava. And if the right side isn't pumping blood onto the lungs very well, that means that it's not got room for blood to come in from the liver. And so more often there's fluid accumulation in the liver due to heart problems, congestive heart disease, uh, sorry, congestive heart failure. Um, there is certainly a problem in the lungs, um, 
which is going to sort of develop later on as the congestion in the system gets worse. And that can lead to uh, pneumonia setting in, just as there's more fluid in the lungs. It gives uh, <clears throat> opportunistic infections a chance to uh, grow there. So people with congestive heart failure sometimes will, especially in older people, uh, will present with um, pneumonia kind of because of it's secondary to the accumulation of fluid that's, or I should say, uh, it's related to the accumulation of fluid, which is secondary to the poor circulation from the heart pumping correctly. So does that get it what you're asking? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think in class yesterday I did talk about the pulmonary and systemic circulation, uh, but here's the picture from the book, uh, kind of putting it all together. Okay. Um, I didn't actually use this picture. I used the other picture more, but uh, this shows all the players there. We've got the uh, <coughs> vena cava coming into the right atrium, um, the <coughs> tricuspid valve, and then the right ventricle, and then the pulmonary valve and the pulmonary trunk going off the lungs, coming back from the lungs, the pulmonary veins connect to the left atrium, and then through the mitral valve into the uh, left ventricle, and the left ventricle pumps through the aortic valve to the aorta. And again, in a drawing like this, they kind of have to move the aortic valve over a little bit so we can see it, but it's really going to be pretty much posterior to uh, the pulmonary trunk there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so again, when I uh, at the end, when I'm done, you're going to start looking at the models. Please think about that pathway all 12 players there and follow the uh, movement of blood through the heart um, and consider the three-dimensional relationship and where we, these things f are found. Okay. The right side of the heart is also more anterior and the left side of the heart is also more posterior and you'll see that when you look at the um, models. Like when I pulled the uh, wall off the left ventricle, left atrium, we were looking at the posterior side of the heart, and that's where most of it was. Um, so you'll see that. Um, and let's see. Um, I can sort of put all this together. Um, the vena cava and then the right atrium, and the tricuspid valve. Ah, that didn't work either. Um, there we go, tricuspid valve, right ventricle, pulmonary valve, no wait, pulmonary valve, pulmonary trunk, and then lungs. Uh, <clears throat> pulmonary veins. Left atrium. Mitral valve, left ventricle. Aortic valve, aorta. So um, when we get to that point, I'll uh, put this back up on the screen when you're looking at the models so you can kind of follow that um, pathway through. Uh, but I'm going to move off that if you're trying to write it down real quick. Haha, <laughs> gotcha. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is uh, about the electrocardiogram. And so in the material for this week, uh, there's a link here that says Nobel Prize Electrocardiogram website. Um, and, uh, of course, we used the Nobel Prize blood typing website last time. That was just Monday, right? Um, and so uh, here's a link to the blood typing thing we were on before, but there's here, one here for the electrocardiogram. 
Um, the link I give you takes you to this page, um, which doesn't code very well in the browser for whatever reason. Um, there's white on white text down here, which is part of the problem with it showing in the browser correctly. But uh, if you move your mouse around, you'll find the link that that text uh, represents, which takes you to an article, um, which is uh, <coughs> fairly similar to the way that the blood stuff was uh, presented. Uh, so I want to talk about this a little bit. It's a little unfortunate. Um, this little thing here says that the Flash Player 6 is required. Um, I have Flash Player 6 installed on this computer. It's updated. I just did it last week. Um, but I'm still getting this error message, uh, which is annoying, because what's supposed to be here is an animation showing the um, conduction pathway. Um, we'll see basically what that animation is a little later, but it's unfortunate it doesn't show up here. Um, <clears throat> it goes on to talk about where electricity comes from, the electrical activity in these um, cells. Um, I talked about that some last time. I was talking about action potentials and contraction profiles and that sort of thing. Um, and you understand electrical activity in uh, <clears throat> muscle cells and neurons from AMP1. And then yesterday in lecture, I sort of expanded that to include uh, the special aspects of cardiac muscle cells. Um, then it goes on to talk about the challenge of what the device, the electrocardiogram, can do and uh, the person who was honored with the prize for what he discovered here. Um, the issue is, is that we're talking about electrical activity in the heart, inside the body, uh, which is going to be measured in millivolts. And for any given cell, the change in electrical activity, the membrane potential, is going to be at most 100 millivolts worth of change. But the EKG is able to measure that activity at the level of the skin. So this is a non-invasive test. We don't have to put electrodes into the heart to measure the, the electrical activity of the heart directly, but rather we put electrodes on the surface of the skin to do that. And so this guy down here did that using a device called, that's weird. Um, I was trying to highlight that word there, but it's galvanometer. <laughs> galvanometer, um, which is just something that measures the electrical current at the skin. The skin has uh, fluid in it. It has electrolytes in it. So um, it's going to have some electrical current associated with it. Um, and uh, so what this guy figured out is how to record that electrical activity at the level of the skin reliably to reflect the electrical changes associated with the heart. Um, and so this gets at the idea that you put electrodes on um, the body and you can chart the electrical changes from that. And um, <clears throat> so the electrodes are placed actually at 10 locations. Um, these pictures here are getting at how <coughs> three of those locations are kind of the main ones that we pay attention to. And actually, um, to show you that stuff a little bit better, I want to go to... Here we go. This picture here. Um, so <clears throat> these dots represent the placement of these electrodes. There are 10 dots here. There's one on the right arm, one on the left arm, one on the right ankle, one on the left ankle, and then six that go across the chest right where the heart is. Um, now, uh, we usually think of right arm and left arm, uh, that sort of thing, at the wrists and the ankles. Um, but in actuality, they don't have to be all the way out at the end of the limb. Um, that's a good place to really isolate the electrical activity recorded there. But um, whatever electrical activity is happening at the wrist is happening because it's being transmitted along the length of the arm. And especially for the arm electrodes, um, sometimes they're put on the shoulders. Um, if somebody's on a telemetry unit in the hospital where they have an ambulatory EKG going, um, Usually all of the electrodes are located around the trunk of the body. So the arm electrodes are at the um, shoulder, and the leg electrodes are actually going to be on the hips because um, it would be really hard to, you know, if you just had cardiac surgery and you're trying to walk around after surgery uh, to get your uh, system working properly, it would be really hard to make 
you know, rounds on the hall getting your exercise if you have wires attached to your ankles. So they're actually attached up here. Um, the standard EKG that's done, uh, you know, just quickly in the doctor's office, they do actually put the uh, ankle electrodes on the ankles because it's pretty easy to do that. And that person doesn't have to walk around while the recording is taking place. Um, <clears throat> anyways, those are the uh, locations the electrodes are placed. Back to this um, diagram here, uh, the right arm, right, I mean, sorry, right arm, left arm, and left leg electrodes are the important ones here. Um, and up here it's talking about Einhofen's triangle uh, because if we draw a line from one to the uh, other of those three electrodes, we basically draw three sides to a, a triangle. Um, I kind of wish this picture was represented slightly differently. A good way to do this is to just draw the triangle from the right arm to left arm, left arm to left leg, left leg to right arm. So you have this triangle it's superimposed on the chest. Um, each side of that represents uh, a way that you can compare electrical activity from these electrodes. Um, and those are called leads. I mean, yeah, leads. A lead essentially is any time two or more electrodes are being compared to each other. And so when the right arm and left arm electrodes are compared, we have a lead which is called standard lead one. When right arm and left leg are comp compared, we have standard lead two. And when left arm and left leg are compared, we have standard lead three. Um, and that's what this picture is showing. So it's just showing one side of the triangle at a time. This is standard lead one, standard lead two, and standard lead three. Um, down below, they have a similar setup. Uh, here, all three electrode placements are compared at the same time but um, the comparison is a little bit more complex. And these are called augmented leads. They're just different leads. Um, you can also get leads by comparing each of the chest electrodes to really the grounding electrode, which is the background activity that you can uh, isolate out the electrical activity at each of these electrodes separate from all of the background electrical activity in the body. And that'll give you a picture of what's happening in at that point in the heart. Okay, so these six spots right here, um, compared with the grounding electrode, can give us a very good picture of what's happening at that spot in the heart. Uh, these are referred to as precordial leads usually. Um, I don't quite know where the name comes from, but uh, that defines 12 leads. Uh, there are 10 electrodes and 12 leads in the standard uh, EKG recording setup. Um, <clears throat> They don't show the other six leads, the precordial leads in these pictures here. This is just getting at the triangle thing. And really all we ever can, are worried about is standard lead two. Uh, the line that we've drawn here from the right arm to the left leg is basically parallel to the axis of the heart. Okay? And so by comparing those two electrodes, we're basically getting a picture of what's happening from one end of the heart to the other end of the heart. And we're just looking across the atria versus um, ventricles. Um, and so as we record that electrical activity, we would see a trace that looks kind of like this. That's the EKG trace. Um, I didn't talk about that all in class yesterday, did I? Right? I said we're going to do that in lab and skipped over. Right. Okay, good. Um, oh. Wrong direction, right? Okay. So this picture depicts um, what we get in a recording. Um, the way this originally kind of worked nowadays with computerized systems, it doesn't exactly look like this. Um, but there should be a um, graph paper that um, a pen is uh, uh, moving straight across with a, a particular rate. So that's measuring time. And then the pen goes up or down depending on electrical changes that we sense through the electrodes. Um, the direction it moves up versus down isn't terribly important. Um, but when we do see a bump like this or a bump like this, 
what that signifies is that there's a change in the electrical activity. Okay? Um, we're used to thinking about graphs that are showing us the membrane potential, like negative 70 millivolts to positive 30 millivolts or something like that. Here, we're just signifying that there's a change in electricity. Um, but we're not actually mapping the specific um, voltage that we see. Um, in this strip up at the top, we see four events that all look the same. That represents four different heartbeats. Down below, they're showing us two. And the first one is labeled, telling us what we call the different uh, waves on the EKG trace, when the pen moves. So the pen starts off at the zero point, and it moves up, and we call that the P wave. And it goes back down to zero, and moves down and up and down and back to zero. That down, up, down thing is the Q, R, and S waves, which we collectively call the Q or S complex. Uh, they happen so quickly together, uh, and they kind of really represent one event. Um, so we just lump them all together. Uh, and then after it's at zero again for a while, the pen moves again, and that's what we call the T wave. Now, the P in P wave stands for something, and I can't remember anymore what it actually stands for, but there's a reason why they started with P. So it's P, Q, R, S, T. And then the next heartbeat, we see a P wave, Q, R, S complex, and a T wave. And then the next heartbeat, we see P, Q, R, S, T. And we would keep seeing that repeating over and over, P, Q, R, S, T. And it's just representing the activity in the conduction pathway. Now, um, I did talk about the conduction pathway a little bit last time, right? In yesterday in lab. I pointed to the different things um, with a picture that looked where'd it go? like this, right? And then I, I walked through this series of pictures. See a lot of blank stairs. So I'll take that as a no. I didn't talk about that? OK. So um, <clears throat> in the wall of the heart, there are some specialized um, structures, cells, that are specialized for conducting electrical activity. They are um, uh, cardiac muscle cells but they're conductive cells. So together they represent what we call the cardiac conduction pathway. Um, and so everything that's in yellow in this picture here represents that conduction pathway. The first cell, I mean the first location in the pathway where it begins is right here, which is what we call the sinoatrial node or the SA node. Didn't say anything about this yesterday in line? Nice. Okay. I had a, another class right after you guys, and they're a different format, so I probably did talk about it there. Excuse, excuse, excuse. Um, anyway, so there's a sinoatrial node, um, and that's where things start. These cells are autorhythmic. They generate their own action potentials, and um, the rate at which they generate their action potential sets the pace for the heart rate. The SA node is often referred to as the pacemaker uh, for the heart. You usually hear pacemaker in reference to artificial pacemakers. Those are implanted when somebody's SA node isn't doing what it's supposed to do. Um, but naturally, this is what sets the pace for the um, heart. The cells here um, generate an action potential. And at the end of the action potential, they don't sit at a resting potential. Instead. Uh, there's a slow leak of um, <clears throat> sodium ions into the cell that slowly depolarizes it back to threshold. And then uh, it starts another peak, another action potential that peaks. And then it comes back down. Instead of sitting at resting potential, the sodium leak depolarizes it again up to um, threshold. We get another action potential. The rate that the sodium leaks into the cell and slowly depolarizes it really sets up the speed at which these cells generate the action potentials. And so um, <clears throat> they will uh, do that automatically at a rate of about 100 action potentials per minute, which is going to lead to a heart rate of 100 beats per minute. 
That's what the SA node does on its own. Um, that's not our normal resting heart rate because the parasympathetic system slows that down. Okay. So uh, that slow sodium leak that gets back up the threshold um, is slowed down because the parasympathetic system hyperpolarizes those cells. So it takes them longer to get the threshold. And by slowing it down, it makes the heart rate, heart rate go from 100 to 75. Um, but whatever it is, uh, those cells um, generate those signals. Um, the cells are connected together, all of the cells in the um, heart. And I talk about that in class. Please tell me how to class. No? <laughs> yeah, like the stranded ones that like wrap around the heart. Is that what you're doing? So I showed you the yeah. um, fascicle structure of the whole heart, but I didn't talk about the specific cells. Oh my God. Um, so I'll show you that in a second, but all of the cells in the heart are interconnected together. So when one depolarizes the sodium cell, sodium ions that are getting into that cell travel into the next cell directly and it depolarizes that cell. Okay. Um, they basically have electrical connections with each other. Um, and so the signal spreads throughout the um, heart. Uh, the white lines that we see in this picture here um, are suggesting that from the SA node, the signal will travel throughout all of the atrial wall, okay, which is true. Um, and it's connecting to the muscle cells that are specialized for contraction, and that's going to depolarize and cause the contraction of uh, the atria. Um, in this picture and in some sources talking about this, they'll draw in these three yellow lines that go from the SA node to the next stop along the uh, pathway, which is the AV node or the atrioventricular node. Um, and so the yellow lines aren't terribly important because the white lines are going to get to the AV node also. Um, they're just uh, the AV node is in the atrial wall, and the SA node causes the entire atrial wall to depolarize. So the AV node will get that signal. Um, the yellow lines just highlight that there are some specialized conduct conduction pathways there, but uh, they're not terribly important for what we're talking about here. Uh, then, the, So the AV, AV node receives the signal from the SA node. The SA node has caused the atria to depolarize and contract, the AV node will then pass that signal on through the rest of the conduction pathway, which is the AV bundle, which is that thing that's kind of a dotted line because it's behind um, the um, right ventricle going to the uh, pulmonary trunk there. Um, and it connects into the interventricular septum, the wall between the two sides of the ventricles. Um, and then the AV bundle branches into right and left bundle branches. Okay. And they continue in parallel down through the uh, septum towards the tip of the heart, what we call the apex of the heart. The left bundle branches turn into the left ventricular wall, and the right bundle branches turn into the right ventricular wall. <clears throat> Fibers coming off of that, uh, the right and left bundle branches that actually connect to the other muscle cells in the ventricular walls are called Purkinje fibers. Um, they're just the end of the conduction pathway and they connect to the regular muscle cells and will depolarize those and then the ventricles will contract. Um, <clears throat> this pathway basically separates the signal that causes atrial contraction from the signal that causes ventricular contraction. Um, so actually when the heart beats, it beats sort of in two stages. The atria contract and then the ventricles contract. Okay. So it's beat, 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 beat. Right and left are doing the same thing at the same time, which is going to move the blood through the whole system. But uh, atria and ventricles are, are beating in sequence. So the blood in the atria are uh, is... Uh, pumped down into the ventricles, and then the ventricles pump that blood out into the uh, arteries. So blood in the atria pumped into the ventricles, and that pumps it out into the arteries. 
right and left are doing the exact same thing at the exact same time, but with different blood. Yeah. So when my kids get sick, they get murmurs. I don't know why, but they do. So what is that? That's something you need to talk to your doctor about. Well, they said it's benign. They say like it happens when kids get sick, but what is it like? What's um, the actual function? Like, what's it doing? So heart sounds are really the sounds of blood moving through the heart. Right. So the traditional heartbeat, lub dub, lub dub, um, is the sound that blood makes as it's moving through the AV valves and then through the semilunar valves. Um, if you're hearing additional sounds beyond that, those are murmurs. Um, one reason somebody can have a murmur is because of an atrial septal defect. So there will be a lub dub, but then there will be this little swish of additional blood moving through that um, patent foramen ovale. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so that'll sound a little unusual. Um, why that would necessarily co-present when they're sick of some sort, I have no idea. But if you're really concerned about it and you want details, go to your doctor, say, we had the heart lecture, tell me what the hell's going on with my kids. And maybe they'll give you more details. So. I just wanted to know, like, what actually was... Yeah, I mean, moving. when you hear sounds, murmurs, or even the regular heart sounds, that's the sound of blood moving. And you shouldn't hear it except for the lub-dub. Mm -hmm. And so if you're hearing additional stuff, murmurs, that means that there's somewhere else that blood's moving where you wouldn't expect. It doesn't mean there's a hole in the heart, necessarily. The ASD is just an example. Um, <clears throat> I really hope this isn't it, because this is a bad thing to have happen, but... Uh, there's a condition called bacterial endocarditis and where bacteria basically build up on like one of the corners of the heart. And so as blood is flowing through, just like you have breath sounds when you have a lung infection, you might have something like that in lungs. But I really hope that's not what's going on because that's a bad condition for your kids to have. And I'm sure they wouldn't say that's benign. Um, <clears throat> anyways, um, the conduction pathway basically uh, makes it so that the heart beats in that correct sequence, so that it moves the blood through in the pathway that we laid out earlier on purpose. Okay, sorry, I thought I had covered that, and I really do get kind of um, thrown off by teaching you guys a half a lecture, and then in the afternoon I teach another class, the whole thing. So there we go. Um, so where were we? Okay, back here. The P wave represents that depolarization of the atria. Okay, so when the SA node starts its job and then the signal travels through all of those white arrows to the entire atrial wall, that's the P wave. Okay. When the P wave's over, the atria are still um, depolarized. It doesn't mean that they depolarize and go back to zero there's just a change in the electrical potential. So uh, the muscles were, are mostly at a resting potential. Only the autorhythmic cells um, have that uh, autorhythmic nature, the leak there. But all the other ones do sit at a resting potential until they get to the signal. Um, so they're sitting at a resting potential and suddenly they change their um, membrane potential. And that's what we're seeing with the P wave they're still depolarized and they'll stay depolarized for about 100 milliseconds, okay, which is about to right here. Um, <clears throat> we just don't see the line high up because the line's not actually measuring the absolute membrane potential. It's just measuring events where electrical activity is changing. The next thing we see is the QRS complex. So this is huge event, which is really about the depolarization that spread through the AV node and the AV bundle and the bundle branches down to the apex of the heart, and it's spreading throughout all of the ventricular wall. And there's a lot of muscle tissue there. So there's a lot of electrical changes, and we have this huge event, this big spike here. Um, again, when the spike is over and the pen is back to the zero line, that doesn't mean that the cells have repolarized and they're back to rest. They're still depolarized. They stay depolarized, and the ventricular cells stay depolarized for almost 300 milliseconds. And then when they repolarize, that change in the membrane potential is the next thing we see, which is the T wave. Okay. So um, P wave to QRS complex represents the atrial depolarization and contraction. And then QRS complex to T wave 
represents the ventricular depolarization and uh, contraction. Okay. Um, the atria do that for about 100 milliseconds. The ventricles do that for almost 300 milliseconds. Um, and yesterday, did I end just before talking about the heartbeat or right after? Did I show you that circle thing? OK, so that's where I'm going to start tomorrow. And that timing, that 100 milliseconds for the atria and the 300 milliseconds for the ventricles is going to be important as we see the timing, time course of a heartbeat. So that's where it's going to come from. Um, and then after the T wave, the ventricles are repolarized and they're relaxed. And the heart stays relaxed for the rest of the heartbeat. And then the next P wave represents the start of the next heartbeat where the SA node depolarizes the atria. And the atria stay depolarized until they depolarize and the ventricles depolarize. And then the ventricles stay depolarized till the T wave where um, uh, they then repolarize again. So we see P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T for normal heartbeats. And there's this flat line, zero uh, mark, in between each one which is just the heart is completely at rest. There's no electrical activity going on there, um, and we change. If we want to measure the heart rate on an EKG, we can look at the QRS complexes and look at where they fall. The distance from one to the next, we can count out by these little boxes. Um, each little box is a millimeter, and so five of them together is five millimeters, and we can see one two, three, four, five, is that right? Oh yeah, um, <clears throat> lines there. So we go from here to there, that's um, five millimeters, another five millimeters, another five millimeters, another five millimeters. Each five millimeter block, the big chunk of five little boxes, um, is two tenths of a second long. So we can look at that and say, well, there's four two tenths of a second long stretches there, which means that the time from one heartbeat to the next heartbeat is eight tenths of a second. Okay. And we're going to use that number quite a bit because at that rate, that means the heart is beating at about 75 beats per minute. Okay, So we're going to see that 800 milliseconds or eight tenths of a second time frame quite a bit, which is what we see here. Um, in the y-axis, we're measuring millivolts. Um, and a big box, the five little squares added up together, is like a half a millivolt. Okay? Um, and so over here, um, the zero line up to uh, two boxes high, two major boxes high, that's one millivolt. Okay? Um, so the changes we're seeing recording at the level of the skin are less than a millivolt worth of change. Okay? QRS complex, uh, when they're really big, will look like about a millivolt here. Exactly what um, magnitude of change we see depends a little bit on how the, elect the electrodes are placed. So uh, you can't look at somebody's EKG and say, hey, there's a nice big QRS complex. There's a lot of electrical activity there because it might be that the electrodes aren't quite placed perfectly. And so you're not getting a good clean reading, um, which definitely means that you can't compare that kind of stuff between two EKGs. Okay. Um, all we can really think about EKG wise is what we see, the shapes we see over a particular time course. Okay. Um, within a single EKG, we can look at magnitude of things, which might say something here or there, but, um, but we can't really compare that stuff across. So um, <clears throat> that's the EKG, um, which is a recording of what's happening here. In the book, um, this little sequence of pictures here kind of shows you um, how the conduction pathway plays out. So SA node to AV node through AV bundle, bundle branches up into the walls of the heart. And then the purple that you see in the atria or the ventricles down here represents the muscles in those uh, chambers being depolarized and starting to contract. Uh, this picture is repeated after the discussion of 
the electrocardiogram down here. So this is the exact same sequence of pictures that I just pointed out, but now the EKG is laid out next to it to show you what events correspond to what's happening here. So um, it's a little hard to see exactly, but like the P wave right now is purple in color. Okay, that's what's happening at this stage in the sequence. And then here, um, the purple part is between the P wave and the curious complex, and that's when the atria are doing their thing. And then the curious complex fires off, and that's what's happening. And then the flat line after the curious complex, we see that. And the T wave, kind of still see that going on. And then after the T wave, when the heart's completely rested between heartbeats, nothing's going on in the picture, and we don't see anything there. Okay, So you can kind of follow the um, sequence of events, and here we're looking at the uh, conduction pathway tied together with the EKG. Okay. Now, um, back to this. Uh, the thing that we can't see here because of the flash player error in the browser is basically an animation of what that sequence of pictures shows you. And we'll see that soon enough. I just don't have it here on this, this screen. Um, the animation that we can't see and the one that we will see eventually uh, uses the heart drawn like this. Um, and in that first animation, it's shown in a normal heart. Uh, here we see hearts that have some problems. This first one represents a heart that's had a cardiac infarction or heart attack. Uh, when that happens, a, a coronary blood vessel has been blocked and oxygen can't get to some of the tissue. So this black spot right here represents tissue that was starved of oxygen. And when that happens, the tissue dies, it can no longer be electrically active or, it, or cause contraction. So the heart attack really is because part of the wall of the heart's died and it's having kind of spasms as it's dying off. That's a heart attack. And then after the heart attack, the tissue will be affected by that um, by being dead. The left bundle branch that we have here passes through what's dead tissue here. So it can't conduct the signal up the um, ventricular wall. Okay? So that's going to affect what we can see with the EKG. And you'd see evidence of that because the EKG doesn't look normal. And it would be because there's some problems with the end of the left bundle branch stuff over there. This other picture shows something kind of similar. It's subtle in the picture, and especially because I have the lights on in here, you probably can't see it very well. Um, there's a little black patch right here at the beginning of the left bundle branch. It's called a left bundle branch block. Um, it's not necessarily dead tissue. There's just something wrong with the tissue there. And the conduction pathway doesn't work from that point on. What that means here is that the right bundle branch will work just fine, the left bundle branch won't conduct signals up into the left ventricular wall, which is going to throw off what's going on with the heartbeat, too. With the EKG, we can see evidence of these sorts of problems with the tissue because those P, QRS, and T waves don't look right. And that tells us where there's problems going on. We can understand some of, some of what that is. Okay. Um, the rest of what this talks about is more of stuff that you understand about muscles and um, electrical activity, repolarization, depolarization, that kind of thing. It ends with a little thing about um, artificial pacemakers. Um, it has a link here that says play the electrocardiogram game. Uh, clicking on this will take you back to this page here, which is the page that I give you the link to. So this link here goes to this page. Um, you can find the link to the article if you want to read the article again. But really the point of going here is to get the link to the game. Now, <clears throat> this game is a little bit different from the blood typing game in that it's a sort of a first-person shooter setup. But um, you're just looking out, and you're the doctor. You have these four patients that you need to uh, see. So patient Mr. Yellow, highlight his name, push the intercom, intercom button, and he shows up with his yellow tie, Mr. Yellow. A um, little information about him. He says he's got to have an EKG. Is it going to hurt? And you, of course, say, no, no, it's not going to hurt. Take all your clothes off and lay down. So as yeah, good bedside manner there. Um, now, a word 
couple of words I want to mention, or not words, a couple of things I want to mention. One, uh, I've been saying EKG, and pretty much everything we've been looking at has been a, a abbreviated ECG. I do that on purpose. Um, one reason is because I'm old and I get to do what I want to. Um, I've been having EKGs my entire life. I have uh, cardiac problems. And so they've always been called EKGs. I always call them EKGs. But the real reason I do it is because speaking, ECG is too close to EEG. It can be a little confusing when you hear that. But EKG, it's very obviously K. Um, the reason why there's two abbreviations is because originally the EKG, the guy that got the Nobel Prize, was named by German-speaking physiologists. So cardio is spelled with a K. Nowadays, science is pretty much exclusively uh, using English as its primary language, so cardio is spelled with a C. And so somebody said, well, we can't abbreviate it based on the German spelling when we use the American spelling, I mean, the English language spelling. Um, so there's a movement to change it to abbreviate it with a C. Um, it, I have some issues with that, but the big problem I see really is uh, that it can be a little confusing when you're talking about this stuff to tell the difference between some of these abbreviations. But EKG is very easy to hear, and you know that I'm talking about electrocardiogram. So I'll use EKG, even though as you're reading it, you'll see ECG. Just understand mm -hmm. they're the same thing. Um, the other thing I want to mention is the Nobel Prize website is administered by Europeans, Scandinavians, uh, which have different sensibilities than Americans. So as I hit the button to go to the next page, please don't be offended. Um, people in Europe wear Speedo underpants. Okay? <laughs> um, they are, of course, yellow because this is Mr. Yellow. Now, not all of the patients have Speedo underpants. This guy does. But, um, so uh, these are the 10 electrodes that need to be placed. If you hold the mouse over the electrode, it tells you where it goes. So this is the left arm electrode. This is the left ankle electrode. This is the right arm electrode, right ankle electrode. And then these five, uh, six are all chest electrodes. Um, you don't have to place them exactly. Just hold them over the chest somewhere, and the game will automatically place them. Once you've done this for one patient, the next patient you get will have a button on the table here that says something like, place electrodes, and you just hit that and it does it automatically. Or you can do it manually if you want to. Once the electrodes are placed, you move on to the recording, and I want to talk about some things that we can see here, uh, even though things are going by a little fast. The color's a little hard to read, so let me turn the lights off so you can see stuff a little bit better. Um, this is in real time, so it's going by very fast, and I'm not expecting you to see things, uh, to understand everything that's going on here, necessarily. But um, the animation of the heart we see here is kind of the animation that I said we couldn't see in the article page earlier. Um, so this is showing you how uh, the conduction pathway is animated in this website. The SA node right here flashes yellow. A yellow line connects to the AV node, and then the AV bundle, and then the branches left and right going up there. They don't specifically have the Purkinje fibers highlighted here just because of the way that they've drawn this sort of thing, but you can kind of see that. Um, the wall of the heart flashes a darker, I don't know, call it purple color, um, <clears throat> representing when it depolarizes and therefore it's going to contract. Um, we see the atrial walls depolarizing with the SA node, and then we see the ventricle walls depolarizing as the signal travels along the, the bundle branches and uh, along. Now this particular one, this guy has a problem, so we don't see the left side doing what it's supposed to, but um, if we could have seen the uh, proper animation earlier, you'd see the whole thing. And you will get to see a normal heart in one of the other patients. Now this guy, if we go back to the pictures I was showing you earlier ago, and it's talking about the left bundle branch, this is the heart with the left bundle branch. Um, and so what happens with this guy is the signal's coming along through the AV bundle, and then it branches left and right. And on the right side, it stops right there. And we don't see any yellow continuing down on the left side. So we don't see the darkening representing depolarization following that signal like on the right side. On the left side, instead, at the end of the heartbeat, the entire ventricle flashes a dark color at once. Okay. Um, and we'll see that in more detail in a little bit. 
Over here, we have the recordings as they're going on. They're definitely going by way too fast to, to make any sense of. But uh, we can look at the different leads. So here we have leads one, two, and three, the standard leads. We can switch to the three augmented leads, or we can switch to each of the individual chest electrode-based precordial leads. Okay. Now, all of the leads have P, Q, R, S, and T waves. They just look very different from what we're used to thinking of. And what we're used to thinking of is the standard lead two. Okay? So sure, we see events in one and three and all these other leads, but they're not the shape that, they're nowhere close to the shape that we talked about earlier because that's not the leads that we think about. Now, when you switch the schematic setup, one, it slows it down so you're not seeing all this stuff happening at once. And you have these arrow buttons so you can control the animation. Also, you're only going to be looking at standard lead two. Okay, so I push the button once, and we see the P wave form. And over here in the animation, we can see the SA nodes lit up, the internodal pathways lit up, and the atrial walls are flashing the darker color. Because in the P wave, that's what's happening. It's the depolarization that's spread throughout the atria from the SA node directly. Uh, push the button again, and we have the EKG trace at the zero line. We can see the AV node and the AV bundle doing their thing, but we don't see that on the EKG. That's not a big enough electrical event to register on the EKG. So the EKG is kind of in a little flat line right there. And then when that signal starts to go down, the bundle branches in, uh, into the intraventricular septum, then we see the beginning of the, S, the QRS complex. And then we continue on, and the QRS complex is growing a little bit more, and we see the right bundle branch getting to the apex and starting to go up the right ventricular wall, and the depolarization following that. And then we continue that out, and we get to the peak of the QRS complex. The um, right bundle branch has gotten to the end of its uh, extent, and the... Uh, Ventricular wall in that area is depolarized. <clears throat> Over on the left side, now we see everything depolarized together. Okay. The reason this is happening now is that it's not getting the information directly from the left bundle branch. It's getting it through the right ventricle. All of these fibers are interconnected. So the signal gets spread from here across the, cell, the um, heart. The problem, though, is that the contraction doesn't start at this end and work up to help push the blood up towards the aortic valve. And so the left side of the heart isn't going to work quite right. The right side's doing what it's supposed to, the left side's messed up. Okay. Um, we push the button again, we finish out the QRS complex. Now, in the animation, things kind of go silent here. Okay. Um, the flashing dark is the beginning of depolarization. Here, everything's still depolarized. They just don't have the color representing anything here. What we see with the QRS complex is that it falls off kind of slowly. So the base of the QRS complex is really pretty wide. And that's because the left side is doing everything late. And so the QRS complex falls off slowly as the left side's kind of behind the right side, timing-wise. And then we move ahead. The animation doesn't change over on the heart but we see it play out the rest with the T wave and it finishes out. Now with the schematic view, you can move back and forth through this. So if you want to watch a different part, uh, you can go through that animation again if you want to. Uh, when you're happy with seeing what's going on here, then you move on from this part of the game back to your office and you have the results from Mr. Yellow's EKG. Um, if this is done uh, in modern machines, and I've seen a lot of those myself, it's not going to look quite like this, but the idea is that all 12 leads are, are represented. Okay, um, And the way that they have them here just goes um, alternating between augmented and standard, augmented, standard, augmented, standard, and then the six chest electrode-based precordial leads there. What you're going to do is you're going to compare those to these four conditions that are in the reference book. Now, if you've got four patients in four con conditions, and you're basically figuring out which patient can corresponds to each. So we've got one that's going to have a cardiac infarction. We have one that's going to have a normal heart. 
one that's going to have an arrhythmia and one that's going to have a blockage. Okay. We already know our guy has a blockage because it's evident in the animation we we're just looking at. And the condition should be evident in the animations if you're paying attention. So we open up the book and there are two pages here with example EKGs to compare to our guy. So we open up the first page and if you look at these two side by side, they don't look very much like at all. There's two things you should do when you're comparing these. One, look at standard lead two, the one that we've talked about, and compare them between the two. These don't look anything alike. The reference electrode has a nice sharp uh, QRS complex that's not very wide. Our guy had a very wide base to his. Um, and then the other thing is just to look at the whole thing side by side. Which pieces are uh, look kind of similar? And our guy, his chest electrodes are kind of really chaotic here. Or not chaotic, but um, significant. They're crossing over each other, at least for the first four. And in the uh, example, it's not at all like that. But we have a second example, which is good because we know this guy has a blockage. So this is not the kind of blockage he has. This is another example. And if we care, compare the standard lead two between our guy and the example, they look a lot more alike. The curious complex shape is wider, kind of falls off slowly at the end like our guy's does. And then also just comparing across the two, the size of the waves aren't going to be the same. These are taller over for Mr. Yellow, and they're shorter for the reference. But everything's pretty much going the same direction, okay? Especially with the um, chest electrode leads. Uh, the big event that we see here, and the first one overlaps with the second one, and then the second one overlaps with the third, and the third starts to overlap with the fourth. We see the same thing over here, a lot of overlapping. Um, not exactly the same size, but they look very similar which suggests that this is a lot like our guy. But we know our guy has a blockage because it was out evident from the um, animation. Once you've looked at these and you've found the condition that you think fits for your guy, go to uh, select the condition. And we know our guy has a left bundle branch block, but the option is just bundle branch block. So choose that, hit OK. And then you can move on, and it'll give you the choice to either call another patient or quit the game and pursue the results. You call another patient, you go back to the list with the four names and the intercom button, and you call the next person in. Um, when you're done, you can hit quit the game, and you'll see uh, your the patient's name, your diagnosis, and then it'll tell you whether you're right or, or not. A green check mark means you're correct. A red X will mean you're incorrect. Um, I'm not going to do the other um, patients. You'll do that yourself. You can, if you want to, print the results. I don't want them. You can post them on your refrigerator. You can take a picture of them, put them on Instagram, whatever you want to do. I don't care. Um, you just want to see the results, and then on the lab quiz for this week's lab, or this lab, uh, you'll have a question just like on the blood lab quiz okay, from the blood game. Um, so that's how I'll know that you've done it. Um, so just complete this other four um, patients, and then when you get to the quiz, there will be a question about that. Um, now, there's a link here that says EKG examples. If you click on it, if you've tried to, you get this box error page saying there's nothing there. And there's nothing there because I deleted the thing off of box, and I forgot to delink, delete the link out of um, Blackboard. So let me just get rid of that because we don't need it. And the reason we don't need it is because it's gone now. Um, in the book, we have that stuff. So in this section that's been talking about electrical activity and EKG, it has this everyday connection section towards the bottom, which has an example of a few different types of EKGs. Um, the first one is a different kind of blockage um, called second degree or partial block. And here what's happening is not every P wave is causing a QRS complex. So here we have a P wave and nothing happens. Then we have another P wave and a QRS complex and a T wave. Then another P wave, nothing happens. P wave, QRS complex, T wave, P wave, QRS complex, T wave, P wave, QRS complex, T wave, whoops, T wave, P wave, QRS complex, T wave, P wave, nothing, P wave, QRS complex, T wave. Okay. Not every P wave causes a QRS complex. That's a partial blockage. Something between the SA node and the AV node 
is compromised and the signal doesn't always get through. But it does sometimes. It's just a partial block. Um, let me jump down to the bottom down here. They have another type of blockage called third degree block. But what's happening here is that the P waves aren't being at all successful in causing curious complexes. We see curious complexes, but if we look at them, there's not a P wave right before each one. Okay. And we can see P waves. That's a P wave there. That's a P wave there. There's a P wave in there. That's a P wave. So the P waves are occurring and the QRS complexes are occurring, but they're not together because there's a blockage, a complete blockage between the SA node and the AV node. When that happens, when the SA node is not sending anything to the AV node, the AV node will fire on its own. So we have QRS complexes because the AV node does its job. Just the rate is a lot lower. I'm not going to bother counting all this uh, boxes down here, but this is probably about 40 or 50 beats per minute. When your SA node doesn't work, or when it doesn't send the proper signal to the AV node, then um, the AV node will fire on its own. It's also autorhythmic. It's just autorhythmic at a slower rate. It's a, enough of a rate that it can set a heartbeat up to keep blood moving around your body, but not really that well. You'll get very tired very quick, probably even just getting up off the couch and walking to the bathroom. You'll get winded walking to the bathroom. Yeah, it might be a little bit of an exaggeration, but get winded very quick. Definitely going up a flight of stairs will knock you out. Um, there are probably people in the world right now that are living like this and like, ah, eh, I'm out of, I'm out of shape. I get winded pretty easily. Who cares? But really, it's important because their heart's not functioning the way that's supposed to. Um, if the SA node and the AV node both don't work, you have a third level of control. The AV bundle, bundle branches, the the rest of the pathway will fire off also. And by itself, those fibers fire at a rate of about 20 beats per minute, which is really low. It's not enough to actually move blood around your body easily. If you're standing up, it's not enough to push blood up into your brain. So you'll pass out, and you'll be laying down. And suddenly, gravity is not an issue, and blood's being pumped around your body just fine. If your SA node doesn't work and your AV node doesn't work, um, you better be laying down. That's the only way that you're going to get blood to all of your major organs. And more than that, you better be laying down in the back of an ambulance or in a hospital at the time because things are really bad. So if that happens and you collapse and you're laying there on the floor and nobody knows it, then uh, things can get really bad really quickly. But um, uh, it is your heart does have some redundancy set up to pick up when things fall apart. Um, the SA node sets a normal pace. If it fails, the AV node has a secondary pace that it can run, which is sometimes called junctional pace because it's a junction between the atria and the ventricles, AV node. And then there's yet another backup uh, where the ventricular fibers will fire on their own, but far too slow to really do any good other than to barely keep you alive when you're laying down. Um, so uh, then there are some other ones here. Atrial fibrillation, ventricular fibrillation, um, and uh, in ventricular tachycardia. Uh, the figure here kind of explains some of those things in some detail. But um, So the book now has a nice set of abnormal EKGs. So what I deleted a second ago was because I used to have to share that separately from the book that we used. But we have it here now. Okay. Um, it also talks a little bit about defibrillators. Um, if somebody has an abnormal EKG, it might be that a defibrillator, a thing that will shock the heart, will get everything back to normal. So that can work sometimes. It talks about that a little bit. Um, so in those two sections, the we just went through the electrical activity one um, and also the heart anatomy, which we did some of it in class. But those two are the topics within this uh, lab material. Um, again, uh, I put it off to the end of the period, so uh, instead of doing it all in the middle. But I did, in fact, leave enough time to do this, even though um, I thought I was going to go way over because I forgot to talk about the um, uh, conduction pathway stuff. But there's plenty of time. So what I'd like you to do with the rest of your time is to look at the... Uh,